Good morning, everyone. Julie, can you bring me the whisper that you just read? It was beautiful. I'll probably never get back to it, but <laughs> it's how it goes. <laughs> I have all of these wonderful sayings, notes. <laughs> Usually I never go there after we start. As many of you know, I just, it feels like just, it's been a very, very big, full uh, eight days that I got back now from um, a seclusion that I took. When I left, that was going to be 12 days. And I was just, I mentioned this when I, in my sermon a few weeks ago, it felt like such a short period of time. I so wanted to be gone for a month so that I could really go deep. That's what I was feeling. But I only had 12 days, so it was an incredible incentive to get there quickly. Like, start on the trip on the way down, <laughs> go with God. And I actually took that very seriously. And right before I left, I think, Yudhistra had mentioned to me that he read a book that Joe Tish had mentioned in a blog called Padre Pio and I. And I immediately was drawn to it I actually realized last night that I never read Joe Tish's blog that week. Usually I do, I'm surprised, but I miss one every once in a while. That was one of them. So I didn't know until last night when I went back to the blog what he said about the book. But because I had had such a profound experience some years ago in San Giovanni Rotondo, which is where... Um, Padre Pio's body uh, is still intact there. So you go there and you really can pray with him. And the whole temple, it's just filled with him, of course. He lived there for, I think, 40 or 50 years there. And he rarely, if ever, went out. He literally never went out so that when somebody said, oh, we saw him in such and such a city, they knew that he had bilocated because he never left his cell. Sometimes after, uh, after his mass, he would sit outside in this little room with a very few of what were called his spiritual children. To us, it would be disciples, but his spiritual children could be with him. But otherwise, he spent most of his entire life in this little cell. You can see pictures of it. And when I look at it, it doesn't feel like a cell, like how I would image, imagine it, because you just feel, even through pictures, the inspiration. But nonetheless, I took the book with me, and I felt from the time that I landed that what I was hoping would come. I was waiting for direction. I was so ready to receive. What's next? I mean, I'm 77. There's a bunch of wonderful, younger, talented, deeply attuned, just wonderful souls here, ready to step in and up. So I was just sort of saying, Okay, you tell me where I should go. And this was actually very important to me, and I think important in terms of this reading, that I have been very clear in my life that when I make decisions, things go, do not necessarily go well. When it's like, this is what I would like to do, and I push it. Of course, I have a lot of energy, and I'm very capable. It's never as uplifting, inspiring, and good for everyone around me as when I can get still and listen 
and receive guidance. Because for any of us, we can all do that. We just forget, and we're so just driven by our egos, every one of us, every issue that we have, every attachment, every desire, every time things don't go well in our eyes. It's all about our ego. I just loved how Swamiji spoke about it first, what a wonderful role the ego plays for us, giving us the incentive, the courage, the energy to do better. And when it's about God to do more and better constantly, that comes from the ego, then at some point, it's almost like when we're ready to take off, the ego gets in the way because then it's me and I and I want and I need and I'm sure I'm right and all of that that's about me and not about this higher inspiration that's mentioned in the um, affirmation today. Also a beautiful affirmation. Well, I went there really committed to having Shanti get out of the way and I took four books with me, and I felt that I would read those four books while I was there. And of course, meditate more and walk and take time to make and eat good food, all the things that one might do in a seclusion. But this book, Padre Pio and I, was one of them. And from the minute I opened the book, I, I can't, and it, obviously it's not just me I'm going to read to you, but just a couple of lines of what Joe Tish said about it. But it's very compelling. And of course, it would be, he didn't write the book, but one of his main disciples, his spiritual son, um, Adolfo, Adolfo? Yeah, Adolfo. I think that's his name, I'm sorry. It's just, yeah, okay. Um, wrote it. But that disciple was so perfectly attuned to his teacher, Padre Pio, that it, you never noticed that it wasn't Padre Pio. It was part of the joy of the book, is that it's all Padre Pio. It's all this great avatar, and he, he is an avatar. So I'm reading the book, so I have this little routine now. Wake up, energize, pray, chant. Read one whisper from eternity every day, but go deep with it. I just said to myself, no rushing here. A couple of days, I just spent two hours reading and rereading a whisper. Now, I've been reading these whispers for decades, we all have. However long you've been around, you've at least been listening to them and maybe reading more. But I was so moved by the end of that each day by this just spontaneous praying that has come through Yogananda and the, the depth and breadth and universality of every prayer. And he brings together every great teacher. He prays to them, all of them. We've heard it in the whispers, but they're so, I mean, it's ridiculous that I'm saying this, but they, they are from eternity. They're literally words to us from God himself if we let them into our heart. And the heart is so meaningful. We always say, but it's important about Padre Pio in our purification in the morning. The master says, open your heart to me. He doesn't say, read this book and then I'll enter and take charge of your life. He doesn't say, get smarter, no more, figure it out. He says, open your heart and I will enter. It's the only way that God can enter. And all of these whispers, I really loved 
the last line of the, the whisper was perfect for today, for this reading. It was just takes time and attunement to be able to find in this whole book that whisper which speaks right to the reading. But just look at this last line, or a couple of lines, teach us to chant in harmony with thy love's manifold expressions that our chorus of souls rouse thee to break thy vow of cosmic silence and lift us into thy lap, thy lap of universal, immortal understanding. It's so beautiful. It's like we, we are going to appeal to you to break that vow of cosmic silence, enter into our hearts, and lift us into your lap of this is what I knew I would forget. It's just so important. Universal and immortal understanding. That pretty much includes everything. That pretty much says, if we are with what Swamiji is calling a true Christian, those souls who are egoless, and we open ourselves, we are ready to receive them. Universal, immortal, love, understanding, compassion. So beautiful. I think Kamala Devi did the altar because this globe that's up here spinning in the middle of all of our masters, is, and it's gorgeous, the globe itself is, you see the whole universe in it. When I walked, first walked out this morning, I said, look at that. Our master's sitting in the middle of all that is. It's like the center of the Empyrean created up here for us with that globe. <laughs> what beautiful attunement and creativity it took. If you haven't seen it, come up afterwards. Now, let me see. So I would read a whisper and already I was blessed in this seclusion, which I still feel after a week of, like one of the busiest weeks of your life. That's what I came home to, or fullest, let me say fullest. But I haven't lost this heart that was so touched, first by Master every morning, and then I would pick up a few pages of Padre Pio, and I, I would pick up the book and read a few pages. It's very easy to read, but it's so deep that nothing in me wanted to hurry. Now, here's the thing, why I'm telling you even this, besides hoping that all of you might stop at some point and read it and feel it because it's, it's, it's transporting, it's transformational. Of course it is. It's about an avatar. I know nothing about Catholicism. Nothing. I hear, I've heard the words, but it's about a Catholic priest. He's a Franciscan. And these very Catholic Italians are telling a lot of the story. So <laughs> I'm in this seclusion, unplugged, doing everything I can do not to turn my phone or my laptop on, because stuff jumps out and it just grabs you. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not doing this. The, one of the whispers that I wound up repeating every single day while I was there, and I've printed it out now. So I just want to read you the first lines. This is how I felt right before I would have to um, open a phone, because I had to keep Googling the terms. All of a sudden, I would say, what is the Eucharist really? I don't know. What does it mean? If, if Adolfo tells us Padre Pio prayed the rosary 50 times every day of his life, well, I don't know what that means. I felt I was supposed to be really like, oh, he prayed the rosary 50 times. 
but what's the rosary? If there's any other good Jew here, do they know it? No, we don't know this. So I looked it up because he was never, ever without his rosary beads, ever. Um, I know I'm just spinning a tale here. I'll never get back to where I was, but it doesn't matter. One night he was sleeping. You know, he always had gloves on with the fingers cut off because he had received the stigmata, and they were almost always open on him, and they were very painful, all of those things. He lived every moment of his life in severe pain. So he has these fingerless gloves long before they were in vogue. Somebody made him a pair of fingerless gloves. And one night, another priest went in, just sort of make sure everything's fine. And Padre Pio looked like he was sound asleep. So the priest decided that he would take the rosary beads out of his hand and keep them as a, a souvenir, but a serious souvenir. But the beads wouldn't leave his hand, like they were stuck there. And the next day, Padre Pio, Padre Pio said, trying to get yourself a little souvenir last night, were you? And then he took off the rosary and handed it to him, full of love, but I mean ever-present, ever-present. It was so beautiful. But before I would open my phone to Google these terms, I would just say, not the whole whisper every day, but the first few lines, impediments beware, flee my path, I am homeward bound. I would say that <laughs> because it was terrifying to open the phone. I really wanted to be unplugged. Sometimes the email or the last text would jump up, and if it's there and somebody says, Shanti, I really need to talk with you, that is so, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but I was in seclusion. So I was like praying this prayer then jumping onto Google as quickly as I could, ignoring everything that even Google's trying to grab me with. I'm not kidding. It was a thing. I, with God's grace, and I mean that so seriously, I was successful. But here I was reading this book where I frequently had to look things up, and I had to feel what does it mean that he prays the rosary 50 times a day. That's a lot when you hear what the rosary is, that each bead becomes a full prayer in and of itself. So doing it 50 times, he just lived in prayer. He lived in communion with God. He lived in love with God. And in that book, Joe Tish's words said, he said in his blog, one of the few books he's ever read that gets into the heart and spiritual essence of the saint. That's what he said. What I would say, add to that, for me, and it's important in terms of our reading today, though it was one soul's experience but I would venture to say, looking out and knowing so many of you, if you read this book, and if you can do it when you're not on the run, because I said something to Carpani this morning about seclusion really is the price of greatness. Yogananda absolutely knew what he was saying, because what comes to us what can possibly come? All of that love, all of that grace, everything that's beyond the planning for a class, even if you're reading great words, the setting up of the equipment if you're doing a webinar with India, the cooking a meal for Master's Kitchen, what joy, great joy, making twice-baked potatoes, but when you do it for 40 people, it takes time, energy, it takes two trips to Costco and Trader Joe's. You're out there. It's not seclusion. It's not. And these inspirations rarely come with the depth and the meaning and the truth 
and the pure love when we're on the run. Doesn't mean we're not living in tune, but it is very different than Jesus' statement to us. Be still and know that I am. He didn't say, do it while you're running errands. He meant it. Get into the stillness of the heart. I was doing that with this book, and it, I said, every page was profound. I'm a very fast reader. I read it for 12 days. I finished it the morning that I left because it was pray, meditate, receive, pray, receive. Looking up words, not knowing any of the religion, but being as profoundly moved, loved, uplifted as I've ever been, not hyperbole, not careless speech. Didn't matter that it was a Catholic priest and a Jewish girl and a self-realizationist. They were all right there, true Christians, truly what Christ was trying to bring here, living in Christ consciousness, having attained that realization that every atom on this universe is, is a spark of divine love. And then, more than anything, each whisper, I was also squeezing in some um, episodes, I started back so that I could get into the spiritual flow of it, the chosen. For those of you who are watching it and enjoying it, I've been very moved by it. So Christ was talking to me. Padre Pio was talking to me. Master, all of our masters, Swamiji. Huge picture of Swamiji on the table. Swamiji, a master in my meditation space there. It, nothing mattered except that pure, divine love that came. That absolute experience. It's the only thing. It's why we're praying. It's why we're meditating. It's why we're focusing on God. It's why we're doing everything we do to get to having that knowing that God is love. That's what it is. That's what we're all working towards. And it's not something that you can teach. It's like this book. This book was not an a, a, just an intellectual sharing. The book is an experience. It was meant to be. That's what Jyotish has said about it. That's what I felt about it on every page of it. He walks in. He shared so perfectly. God himself enters your heart, and then you know in that moment God is love. There's nothing like it. That's what they're all coming. Even St. Francis, who had to beat himself and eat food off the street and all of this that's so unappealing to us, a free soul who did it the way he had to do it and who awakened people from the dead. I mean, had the stigmata. St. Francis also, you look at any of the great souls, doesn't matter what the religion is. There's nothing in it for them. Padre Pio, at one point, somebody came. There's nothing in it for them, by the way. Let me emphasize that. That's why this line is so beautiful that Swami puts in here when he said, Master would never let anybody even call people his disciples. They're not my disciples. They're God's disciples. This is an avatar. That's what they're all, they're just allowing that energy to flow through them. None of it is for them. At one point, there was a woman who came to see Padre Pio. I think this is why she came. It doesn't matter if I'm mixing the stories up. Her, I think her child was really sick, and she came and you know, they all come for the mass that he does, and 
His life was basically filled with hearing confessions. That's the most of what he did. I mean, it was, everybody talks about it. People's lives were changed when they had confession with him. Being in the presence of a truly self-realized being who was a pure bhakti yogi, so much love, so much compassion. Even a moment in the company of a saint can be your raft over oceans of delusion. That's who he was. But she came and she had an audience with him and she prayed to him because he, a lot of miracles happened through him, a lot. But it's not like he was a miracle man. That wasn't the point of it. The point of it, what happens when you can allow God's energy to flow through you? And he handled, handed her a little medal. I don't know which one it was, but a Catholic medal. She, she just told him what was going on. He prayed with her. He hands her this medal, and he turns to Adolfo, and he said, she will convince herself that it was I who healed her child. I'm just a simple friar who prays to God and who loves God and who says to God, do through me as you will. It was so beautiful. You just feel again and again the healing power of body, mind, and soul when it's pure love. Delivered each of them in a unique way. But all they've done is cleanse themselves of ego, cleanse themselves of attachments, cleanse themselves of desires purely. And when we have even moments of that, which I'll bet we all have, you pick up your baby for the first time, or you, I don't know what, my niece just sent me a picture of her little girl starting middle school. It's like the most wonderful moment. You could feel her heart wide open. We've had moments of this where divine love can flow. And what they're saying to us, you know, when I, I just heard Joe Tish say this, so it's fresh in my mind, the story of Swamiji when he was with Master going off to play Christ. And many of us have heard this. Yogananda had asked Swamiji to grow a beard because he looked so young. Then they asked him to play Christ because he had a beard. <laughs> so he was playing Christ. And when he came back, Master said to him, Yogananda said to him, I heard it went very well. They said that you look just like Jesus. And Swamiji said to him, I'd rather be like Jesus than look like Jesus. And Swami says in his book that Master took that very seriously. He stopped, and he was right with him. And he said to him, that will come. And what Jyotish said when he repeated that in some recent talk, he said, Swami shares that story with us. It wasn't just about Swamiji. It's about all of us. That will come. When we get quiet enough, even the way we are, I could write a list for all of you about all of the reasons why I think I couldn't possibly get free in this life. Believe me, I know much more about them than you do, even those of you who think you see them. I live with this being every day. So I know, and I carry, I gotta fix this, I gotta let go of that. I, I, you stop and go deep enough and you realize what they're all saying to us, which is time is an illusion. And in a moment, we could be free if we're willing. It's right there. It's like suddenly you stay still, you stay quiet, you stay in, you stay absolutely with God every minute. As I was reading that book, I never let go of my mala. I slept with my mala. I did everything on my mala, not just my kriya, everything. 
repeating the Lord's Prayer phrase by phrase, a beat, repeating a whisper. I never let it go. It was so such a beautiful way to remember to stay with God. Otherwise, it's shockingly easy to forget. But those beautiful moments when you feel God's true love and you get so close to knowing that you and he are one and it doesn't matter who it comes through, but it does matter that they're a true Christian. God bless you all. with people.
pure hearts their needs I attend. My child, all men's sorrows would turn to joy if they knew that to share is no loss. For its kindness broadens the human heart. Human heart, the human heart. For its kindness broadens the human heart. I know I who died on the cross Worship means but love And my love you found By your gift to me here in the cold And she found their clothes Were now woolen and warm And the shawl was now spun of fine gold To be different, dare to be free, dare to roam far like wind on the sea, fly like a gull, soar high on the air, be strong in your courage when others despair. Without pride, be never abased. Freedom is yours if freedom you give. To all, give it freely. In freedom you'll live. Mountains that stand up tall to the sky tell us no dreaming is ever too high. Dare to climb bold. Brave that high peak, you'll never know failure if bravely you seek. Dare to be different, dare to be free, dare to roam far like wind on the sea. Fly like a gull, soar high on the air. Be strong in your courage when others despair. Be strong in your courage when others despair.